we had very nice talks before uh, talking about indication and how you, uh, how you plan it. Um, what's the goal? The principal goal of surgery is um, after a fast access um, uh, as less, uh, to, to produce as less as possible bone destruction instability. And of course, at the end, when you have a um, procedure that you're very used in, uh, it's the surgical time uh, which allows you to have good results. Um, what are the difficulties in transforaminal surgery? Of, we heard about high iliac crest. Um, we see it like uh, in ritualistesis, uh, posterior disc uh, herniation, um, primary secondary stenosis might cause you problems. Now we have um, seen, um, everybody's talking about transforaminal approach, but when we talk about it, we actually have complete different approaches for different pathologies. If you take a look um, on the far lateral approach, it's completely different um, than the uh, craniocaudal approach where you perform a, a foraminal to me, or um, even the transpedicular approach where you go through the uh, pedicle. So the pathology actually defines where you have to enter the spinal canal. Um, far lateral approach is a f um, an approach often used uh, by, uh, by Rütten, which is one of the pioneers and a good um, uh, endoscopic uh, spine surgeon, but you see he's very far lateral, uh, allowing him to enter the spinal canal, but with a little higher risk of exiting nerve root damage. The fact uh, why this occurs is that the uh, Cambin triangle is a three-dimensional um, triangle, and when you go further lateral, um, you have less area uh, to work on that. One case, um, medial disc herniation, so you see you have to enter the disc space and uh, enough space inside the spinal canal. Good indication for the far lateral approach, you see entering a little bit in the cra uh, um, craniocaudal direction, but aiming at the medial part of the disc space. And the advantage of this approach is that you actually see uh, almost a complete dura, complete dura to the opposite side. Left is cranial, right is caudal. Now, good indication uh, for medial disc herniation and contained disc herniation. The dorsolateral approach, um, I use this approach for uh, intra foraminal disc herniations, and um, you don't have to enter as much in the spinal canal as you do with the normal approach because your pathology is intra and extra foraminal. So uh, what you do is you, once you enter with the scope, you make a turning maneuver um, inside uh, the foramen, and then you turn it to extra foraminal, and you see it in this movie, uh, looking upwards to the, um, to the axilla, now turning it from 180 degrees, and at 12 o'clock you see uh, the exiting nerve root, but you have to keep in your mind, uh, once you turn the scope, um, that uh, the cranial and caudal will change. So a big thing is the orientation, and how does the orientation of this, uh, um, of the intraoperative picture change uh, when you rotate the scope. So a good orientation point um, is the pedicle and SAP, as well as the posterior axis, and once you see the nerve root, the surgery gets neurosurgical, and of course, when you hold the scope differently, um, you have to keep into mind that the, um, the course of your nerve root uh, is different, and uh, that's important to avoid uh, mistakes as well uh, as injuries of uh, neural tissue. And you see, once you look outside, you have the exiting nerve root in your picture. So once you have um, a good view on your neural structures, you should be able to keep them in your picture uh, to avoid uh, problems with that. That's a good indication for a uh, dorsolateral approach. You see an intra extra foramen disc herniation with compression on the right side. You see the placement is a little bit less inside the spinal canal, the opening um, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the intracanal, and you see after the decompression, uh, here is the Cambin triangle, um, here is the traversing nerve root, and here comes the exiting nerve root, and that's where we have the location of the, um, of, uh, of the disc herniation already taken out in this case. So, um, advantage, uh, you have a good parallel uh, position and therefore can reach the inter and extra foraminal area in a nice way. We also have the problem of hidden zone pathologies, and those um, are the most complex cases because you have to either um, take away part of the upper pedicle, come from the opposite side, or go through the pedicle to reach them from the transforaminal approach. So in L5 is one, this might be a good indication for interlaminar, but um, when you try to get them, and to avoid um, persisting problems, you have to take away a little bit more of the bone or change the approach.
So you see here, um, the contralateral approach, it's only possible if you have a, um, a high area in the foramen. Um, if you don't have it, you have to perform a foraminoplasty before and you can actually reach the opposite side um, of, the dis um, of the spinal canal uh, from an entry on the other side. But for that reason, you have to come more lateral, so it's in between 12 to 14 centimeters from the spinous process line. The disadvantage of this approach is um, a little bit more bleeding because you actually work in the epidural space uh, where you have a lot of tissues. The second approach to get migrated disc herniations or um, hidden zone pathologies is that you go through the pedicle itself. And um, this uh, is a good solution if you have um, highly sequestrated disc herniations. Um, you see the position of your working tube is almost the same um, as it would be in the foramen, but you go directly through the disc. You can open up the medial part of the pedicle with a small uh, diamond burr. And um, you see in this case, for example, the, the disc herniation is very close to the pedicle and it would be quite difficult to address this problem uh, in a normal approach. So what you do is uh, um, you open up the medial, uh, the medial uh, part of the pedicle and you see here uh, the loss of resistance, the opening inside, so that it, at the end you can actually have a similar picture with the traversing nerve root. This is the uh, picture after taking out the disc herniation and you see um, there's only a small hole drilled in the pedicle. Of course, you need to have a good uh, and uh, large enough pedicle. When you see a picture of the postoperative status, you can see that actually um, the opening in the uh, pedicle was a complete release uh, for the nerve root uh, of L4. Um, the pro is a fast approach. Cons um, is that you're limited from the anatomical size of the pedicles. So far, uh, we overview about 70 to 80 cases, no pedicular fracture, one fracture of the transverse process. Now the standard approach, and that's um, the, the, the Joymax approach, TESIS uh, technique. And this technique is a quite safe technique because you come from a, do, uh, from a quite a paramedian approach from a cranial to caudal direction. You perform um, a um, foramnioplasty with a small reamer and you position the reamer cuts in the front. Uh, you also have the possibility to use bone drills and you position uh, your endoscope um, exactly um, at the lateral recess, not in the disc, but uh, in the canal. So this allows you to reach most of the uh, cranial caudal pathologies as well as uh, discal pathologies. You're a little bit limited uh, for cranial or extraforaminal pathologies with this approach. And you see a good case, L4-5 paramedian disc herniation with a, um, a slight uh, stenosis. Um, you see the uh, access placement, and you can then work with small diamond burrs. You see here, this is uh, actually reducing um, the SAP with the diamond burr. Here on the right side is caudal, here on the left side is cranial. So that at the end, after taking out the disc herniation, you see a good uh, released uh, traversing nerve root. So with this approach, um, you have a good possibility for the foraminoplasty. And disadvantage, as I pointed out, cranial sequestrated pathologies. And then we have the standard um, Tony Young approach, the interdiscal approach. Um, this is limited, I think, for contained disc herniations. So there is an indication where you might want to go to the disc space. Um, and you see here, um, this uh, approach, since it starts in the disc space, has a slightly higher risk of recurrent disc herniation. And that's what the, one of the uh, speakers uh, who talked before me uh, was pointing it out, but you see when the indication is done and you have a contained disc herniation here, the bipolar behind, uh, uh, behind the posterior ligament, uh, it's a good uh, and powerful approach. When you do L5-S1, you have to keep into your mind um, that it's, it's, it's advised to enlarge the foramen, so you want to make uh, a foraminoplasty, and you see often I start um, the foraminoplasty with docking a Yamshidi needle at the SAP and opening up the neuroforamen. That's due to the fact that um, you have um, um, some changes uh, in the degenerative spine. And um, let me see if this works because we have to finish it up. Um, so there are different uh, possibilities um, once you put the scope inside your spinal canal to decompress uh, the foramen or the central spinal canal. You see you can either um, address the SAP by burying away 
the top, the top of the uh, of the SAP. You can work uh, uh, on the uh, vertebral body and taking a burr and opening up the lateral recess from uh, anterior. You can work more centrally. You can uh, go in the intra-extra foraminal area or uh, go through the pedicle. So you see um, in the detail, it's quite complex. And uh, the key to success for degenerative spine, in my opinion, is to work on the bone. And that avoids recurrent disc herniations. Thank you very much.